welcome back to my channel. My name is Adisa and this is a continuation of the book series that I'm doing about the molecular sensor and nano devices book. So if you guys don't know, if you guys are new, please subscribe below. And I also linked down below the first part of the video, which actually talked about chapter one, which was the introduction to molecular sensors. So today I'm gonna to actually elaborate on chapter two. So let's get started. a chapter that talks about the fundamentals of nanofabrication and microfabrication and the effects of scaling. So I mean, if you guys don't know, I mean, why are we talking about scaling? Why are we talking about the scaling effect? I mean, look at the world that we live in today, where we are going from bulky devices to small, thin, fine micro devices or micro sensors. So, I mean, it kind of seems right to actually do so in the biomedical research. And this revolution of downsizing or scaling that actually started with microchip fabrication. And this interest kind of grew into determining and finding new ways to downsize and finding new nanotechnology in biomedical research. So, scaling down is actually pretty interesting and has a lot to do with sensitivity. And when you're scaling down, you're actually increasing sensitivity. So, which actually means that scaling and sensitivity have an inverse relationship. But that's not always the case. For example, with magnetic particles, scaling down, yes, is great, makes the particles more efficient. But when the drag forces and the magnetic forces which are applied in the particles when the electric field is applied, actually doesn't give much of a great sensitivity to the particles. It actually makes it difficult for the particles to actually pick up the specific ions or molecules that it's supposed to. So, downsizing and scaling down is not always good. But then again, you actually have to look at the different sensors and the different materials that you're working with and determine if scaling down or how much of scaling down is needed to not jeopardize sensitivity. So let's talk about microfabrication. Well, the main element and the main material used for microfabrication is silicone. Silicone is actually used because it's covalently bounded. It actually has directional dependence and it's a pretty cool material, to say the least. You'll be able to make specific patterns based on this directional dependence that silicone material offers. Now that I elaborated on the main material that is used, let's now jump into the techniques. Now there are numerous techniques out there that are used for microfabrication of sensors, of nanotechnology of anything basically such as photolithography deposition etching but let's start from the beginning what is photolithography well photolithography actually uses ultraviolet light a photo mask and a photoresist layer in order to make a pattern onto a substrate and based on either a negative pattern you're able to remove the exposed areas by the UV light. Or when you have a positive pattern, you're actually able to do the opposite. But when talking about photolithography, resolution actually comes in mind. And based on the different exposure, you will get a different resolution, either high, low, mediocre, Lord knows. But some of the exposure that comes with photolithography is contact exposure, you have proximity exposure, and you also have projection exposure. Now the main difference between the two is basically 
how close the photo mask and the photo resist layer are together. With your contact exposure, the photo mask and the photo resist layer are actually close together in contact. But with your proximity exposure, you actually have a gap between your photo mask and your photo resist layer. But also with your projection exposure, there's no mechanical contact between the wafer and the substrate. And it also uses either an optic disc or mirrors in order to direct the UV light onto the surface of the substrate in order for the pattern to be made. So another good technique that is used when talking about microfabrication of sensors or different type of technology is deposition. Now deposition includes or incorporates different techniques such as spin coating, evaporation, etc. You name it, or even chemical vapor deposition. But spin coating, which is one of the techniques, uses an apparatus called a spin coater, which allows the substrate to get evenly distributed onto the surface. And when the deposition happens, salt baking occurs in order to remove the unwanted solvent. So when salt baking happens, the unwanted solvent is actually removed making the photoresist layer actually more photosensitive. The other technique is thermal oxidation. Now with thermal oxidation, you're actually growing a very thin layer of silicon oxide onto the surface of the substrate. And a good advantage to using this technique is that it has a high efficiency, it has high resistivity, it also has a really high etching selectivity. But most importantly, the material that we use, which is silicon oxide, does not require any chemicals to be formed. It actually is derived from either doing dry oxidation or wet oxidation, which just uses either air or water in order for the silicon oxide to be made. Now, the next technique is evaporation. Evaporation actually uses a heated vacuum that actually evaporates and releases vapor particles that travel to the surface of the substrate in order to form a solid. But there are also two other techniques that kind of use the same evaporation process. And those techniques are the e-beam evaporation as well as the resistive heat evaporation. Now, with the e-beam evaporation, you actually use a beam that evaporates these particles and drive them to the surface of the substrate. But with the resistive heat evaporation, you actually generate evaporation of these molecules through the current. And the same process happens. These molecules or these particles actually are driven to the surface of the substrate. Now sputtering. Sputtering actually uses a sputter gas coupled with a DC current that allows ions to travel from the target to the surface of the substrate for the specific pattern to be made. Now, in the midst of using gases coupled with DC voltage, coupled with beams, coupled with heat, coupled with current, whew, chemical vapor deposition is actually one of the other techniques that can be used for microfabrication. And with chemical vapor deposition, you're actually using a chemical reaction to deposit thin films. And some of the materials deposited are graphene, carbon nanotubes, and polysilicone. And a subset of this chemical vapor deposition is actually plasma chemical deposition. And instead of just simply using a chemical reaction in order to deposit these thin films, you're actually using a plasma that enhances the chemical reaction that allows the thin films to be deposited onto the substrate. But the difference between the plasma and just a simple chemical vapor deposition is that the plasma enhanced chemical deposition is actually done at room temperature and can be done with materials that has very little resistance. Now, the next technique is actually my favorite and this technique is called electroplating. So electroplating is actually one of my favorite techniques. I mean, I don't want to be biased just because I do study it, but it kind of falls under the tree of electrodeposition and even under the bigger tree of electrochemistry. 
And with this technique, you're actually doing this into an aqueous solution. And you're driving a current that actually forces particles to move to the working electrode and to create a coat around it. And this coating could actually make up different patterns that could be used for the microfabrication of a different electrode or a different sensor. And in my case, to determine the concentration of dopamine in a sample, in a fluid, or in the brain. Now, etching actually uses a masking layer that is able to mold a structural layer. So the masking layer has a specific structure, a specific pattern that is able to implement and enforce this pattern onto the structural layer, which can be used as a sensor. When dealing with this method, sensitivity is very important. And it is important because it actually determines the ratio between the edge rates of the masking layers. And that's pretty important because you want to be able to make sure that your masking layer is actually resistant to your etchant or your etching solution and that your structural layer is actually pretty easily patterned and can be done efficiently without actually damaging the remaining layers of the sensor. Now, there are two different types of etching, dry etching, and wet etching. So with dry etching, you're actually using free radicals produced by a plasma to actually inflict the different patterns onto the structural layer. And dry etching actually has subsets of techniques that could be used. You could have a reacting ion etching or a deep reacting ion etching. And the only difference between these two is how deep and how steep the structures could be made. So obviously with the deep reactive ion etching, you're able to make steeper and deeper structures. So with wet etching, you're actually using a chemical reaction to remove unwanted items and unwanted metals, or unwanted patterns. So the way this works is that your substrate, which actually has a pattern is actually supposed to be resistant to your etchant so that unwanted metals or unwanted parts of the pattern can be removed without damaging the structural layer. Now, there are again a subset of techniques that actually incorporate wet etching. And these techniques are isotropic etching and inosotropic etching. Now with isotropic etching, you're actually not using directional dependence. And when doing so, you're creating an undercutting or under edging into structures, especially with structures with a thicker material. So that's something you actually need to consider when you're microfabricating your sensor. But with isotropic etching, you actually have directional dependence. And that's basically based on your etching rate and your etching. But you're actually able to form pretty well structures, pretty structures, pretty clean lines and pretty clean cut lines into the patterns that you want. So that might be another option to think about. The next technique that I'm gonna talk about is liftoff. And liftoff actually uses a sacrificial layer to achieve the desired pattern. But it's pretty simple. With the liftoff process, you actually have a sacrificial layer that is patterned and that's deposited onto the substrate. Then, the target material is actually deposited on top, and finally, the sacrificial layer is removed gently. So the remaining pattern will be that of the target material on top of the substrate. Now, there is another technique called doping, and it's not what you think. And doping actually uses impurities in order to achieve the desired pattern. Well, there are two types of doping. There are an ion implementation process, and there's also a thermal diffusion process. So with thermal diffusion, you're actually using impurities at very high temperatures in order to form the desired pattern against the thermal diffusion. But with iron implementation, you're actually using impurities 
that are being driven to an electric field that goes through a slit and actually travel to the surface of the substrate. But let's actually move along and talk about MEMS. MEMS are actually microelectromechanical system. When dealing with microelectromechanical systems, you actually deal with two different techniques that actually will allow for the fabrication of such system. And these techniques are bulk machining and surface machining. So bulk machining is actually used for pressure sensors and strain gauzes. But this process actually selectively etches different patterns onto MEM devices. But with surface machining, you're actually able to create microstructures by etching the deposited layers on the substrate. And with this technique, you're actually able to make movable structures or freestanding structures such as micro cantilevers. Now, soft lithography is actually another technique that could be used. So, soft lithography actually uses a soft pattern, also called a pattern elastomer, to make patterns, micro patterns, or microstructures. Now, what makes up this elastomer? This elastomer is actually made up of PDMS, which is polydimethylcyoxane. But some of the advantage to using this elastomer is its ease of use, its biocompatibility, as well as its durability. So some of the other techniques that actually use this elastomer molds are replica molding, injection molding, I mean, just to name a few, but there are many out there. So a technique that actually uses an elastomer mold is microcontact printing. With microcontact printing, you're able to make a mold made up of PDMS, and with that, you're able to pick up specific molecules based on the different inking method. And that can mean by just picking up the specific molecules, by stamping, or by just dipping the mold into a solution. Now, the other technique that uses an elastomer mold is replica molding. And it's just basically how you hear it. You're actually replicating the opposite of a specific pattern. So if you have a negative pattern with your PDMS, you're able to make a mold that will actually be a positive pattern. So after just making the mold, you'll be able to ink your mold through dipping, stamping, or simply picking up the specific target material and placing it on the substrate. Now, I'm sure that was a handful, but let's switch gears again. I want us to kind of focus on the immunization and patterning of biomolecules. Now, some of the techniques that do exist out there are absorption, which is actually able to analyze DNA through a negatively charged sensor that actually has an interaction with the positively charged DNA code. Now, another technique that's actually used for the immunization and patterning of biomolecules are avidin and biotin interactions. So, biotin has four binding sites and has a high affinity for avidin. And so, after one avidin molecule kind of binds to one of the fourth binding sites, there are three remaining binding sites. And these three remaining binding sites are actually used to bind DNA molecules that have been covered with more biotin to actually attract them to the three binding sites remaining on the biotin molecule. Now, the next technique that could be used for the immunization and patterning of biomolecules are the Theo and Gold bonding. And the way this happens is because Theo has a pretty high affinity for metal groups. And using photolithography, you're actually able to pattern gold metals that will link and that will bond to the Theo groups and could actually make a specific pattern of the biomolecules. And last but not least, 
Inkjet printing is another method and another technique that could be used for the evenization and patterning of biomolecules. And the cool thing about this technique is that it actually prevents cross-contamination by actually introducing droplets through a nozzle or through a thermal bubble formation. And because there's no contact with the nozzle and the surface, uh, cross-contamination between those two is not likely to happen. But then again, when reusing such equipment, cross-contamination actually could happen if efficient and thorough cleaning is not done. Now, there are other techniques that actually are used for the immunization and patterning of biomolecules, such as photochemistry and scanning microscopy. But I'll leave some links down below for you guys to check out if you want to learn more about these methods. Now, it's almost done. And I know this chapter was long, but towards the end of the chapter, the authors actually talk about the top-down and the bottom-up approach. And maybe some of you guys may not know, but it's actually maybe something to consider when you're trying to microfabricate a technology or a sensor. So the top-down approach actually uses computer-aided design tools for the development of devices. And this technique is actually pretty compatible for mass production. While the bottom-up approach actually uses chemicals in order to transfer a particular molecule onto the substrate for the different patterns to be generated. A downside to that approach is not really compatible with mass production. So when thinking about these two approaches, you kind of need to think about if you want mass production or if you don't, or if you want to use a chemical or if you don't. So those are some of the things that you need to think about. Well, after hearing all of this, what do you think the best approach is? So this chapter included so much information, information that helped me and I think that will hopefully help you guys. And we were able to learn about the scaling effect, the different techniques used for microfabrication, as well as the different techniques used for the immunization and patterning of biomolecules. And I'm able to get a clearer idea of what techniques I could probably use in my research. And I hope this book and this chapter was able to give you different insights about that. Well, this is the end of the video. I hope you guys had a good time. I hope I did not bore you to death. And I hope I was able to give you a bunch of information to help you in the future. Please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and don't forget to comment and let me know what other book chapters or what else you would like to see. Thank you so much guys and have a great day.